Hello, this is Dr. Sam Tamikas, and I'm happy to present this lecture on subcellular therapeutic targeting of common lipid disorders. I'm from the University of California, San Diego, and these are my disclosures. Lipoproteins that are genetically associated with cardiovascular risk and also amenable as therapeutic targets are shown in this slide. These include ApoA of lipoprotein little a, ApoC3, and angiopoietin like 3 as well as ApoB uh, of LDL particles. Now, this is an area that's been rapidly growing. As you can see from this slide, there's been several key uh, lipid-targeted antisensor oligonucleotide publications since 2014 in some of the top journals uh, in, in cardiovascular medicine. Now, uh, when we talk about RNA therapeutics, there are really three classes, and today we're gonna focus mostly on antisense technology. But just so everyone understands the distinction, antisense is single-stranded um, modified DNA, and it's modified in a way that can be used as a drug. SIRNA is double-stranded, uh, so it requires two RNA molecules uh, to be used as a therapeutic target. And there's a third uh, 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 therapeutic class, which is not used very commonly, which are aptamers, which we're not gonna discuss today. The two uh, mechanisms, antisense and siRNA, have slightly different mechanisms, but ultimately work in the same way in reducing protein uh, production. Now, this is a relatively uh, young field in its infancy. Uh, these are the only drugs approved that are in the realm of RNA therapeutics. And you see here, there are really only four companies so far that have successfully approved drugs, including Ionis, Sarepta, NS Pharma, and l -Nylum. Now, antisense drugs target RNA via Watson-Crick-based pairing, and they use a mechanism uh, of ribonuclease H1, or RNA H1 mediated degradation, as a way to prevent protein production. And as you can see here on the slide, you have DNA that gets transcribed to mRNA. The mRNA uh, then will be translated to protein. And uh, the mechanism of action of these drugs are quite elegant. The drugs are injected subcutaneously. They go into the target of interest or the cell of interest. They go into the nucleus. And then they bind their, uh, their, uh, their mRNA target in a complementary fashion. And then once this duplex is formed, RNA-CH1 recognizes it and cleaves the sense strand. So this strand right here that would make protein the antisense strand can then actually go, by, go back and bind to another mRNA molecule. And for this reason, uh, these drugs are highly uh, long acting. Now, uh, when you degrade the mRNA, uh, you actually end up having less protein. And the reason why uh, a lot of people love this mechanism and, because it, and why it's so elegant is that you never produce any protein in the circulation that you now have to remove for example, as if you would use an antibody to bind them. Now, another advance has been the so-called galnec targeted antisense molecules, which increase potency 20 to 30 fold. And there's a receptor in the hepatocytes called acyloglycoprotein. This binds a modified sugar called N-acetylgalactose. You can then bind this molecule onto your antisense uh, molecule and inject it uh, and this will eventually end up into the hepatocyte, get internalized. The gallic is cleaved off, as you can see here. The antisense molecule then uh, goes into the uh, nucleus and has the effect I showed you earlier. When you do that, if you take the molecules that don't have the gallic and you add the gallic, uh, you, need now, you now lead, need less than 20 to 30 fold uh, Per, uh, drug. So in that regard, the doses are much lower and the force, the efficacy is maintained and therefore the therapeutic index is much better with this approach for the liver targeted uh, areas. I'm going to briefly mention LDL here and uh, inclycerant is a siRNA that targets PCSK9 uh, mRNA. Uh, there's been several trials that have been completed. This drug is not approved yet. Uh, but it's in the uh, regulatory pathway for being approved for lowering LDL cholesterol. And you notice here, when this drug is given, you get about a 50% reduction in LDL cholesterol. This is two different trials. Uh, 
And an advantage of this drug uh, is that it needs to be injected twice a year, which will offer convenience for uh, lowering uh, LDL cholesterol. Now, I'm going to take you through three other targets, LPA, APOC3, and angel point like 3 which are novel targets. And neither, none of these have an approved drug except APOC3 and Wailivra in the European Union for a very rare condition called familial chylomicronemia. But I'm going to start with LP little a and review this and, and uh, take you up to date on the list, uh, trials with this target. LP little a is composed of an LDL-like particle to which is attached an apo lipoprotein little a, which is derived from plasminogen. It contains oxidized phospholipids in both the APOA and the lipid phase of the molecule. The levels are genetically determined at birth by the number of these Kringles that are present on APOA. Elevated levels can cause cardiovascular disease through three mechanisms, atherogenicity through its LDL moiety, antifibrinolytic activity through its APOA component, and pro-inflammatory effects through its content of oxidized phospholipids. The two key phenotypes are cardiovascular disease and aortic stenosis, and there are no approved pharmacological therapies at this time for it. LP little a was discovered in 1963 by Carrie Bird. Um, as I mentioned, uh, it's derived from plasminogen. There are multiple alleles of APOA that vary according to the number of Kringle 4 type 2 repeats that you see here in yellow. And so there are over 40 different isoforms among the population that are genetically determined from each parent. In terms of its phenotypes, it causes all the cardiovascular phenotypes that, that um, are, are uh, known, including aortic stenosis, but it's not associated with other non-cardiovascular phenotypes. Its metabolism is well known for the most part. Primarily, it is synthesized in the liver, and most of the plasma level is due to liver production. There are a variety of receptors that we're not going to discuss in detail that seem to hear it. The quantitative contribution of each one of those is not well defined. The plasma levels of LPA are a combination of what each chromosome essentially produces. And so you see this patient here has a small number of Kringle 4 type 2 repeats, 10. This patient has 25. Uh, each one of these is associated with a certain plasma level. Because this has lower number of repeats, the liver can make many more particles. So when you eventually look in the circulation, the red here is the contribution of this allele, the blues from this allele. This is 60, this is 10. So the plasma level uh, ends up being 70 milligrams per deciliter. So unlike other proteins, this has contrib different contributions from each allele, but ultimately it's the LP level in the plasma, irrespective of which allele produces it, that drives the risk. It's a very prevalent risk factor. Uh, level 60 milligrams per deciliter or higher are, pro are present about 20% of the population. So that's 64 million estimated in the US, 150 million in the U, and 1.4 billion globally. Now, when you look at the genetic determinants of CAD, uh, you're well familiar with most of these genes in the lipid metabolism and inflammation. This is 9P21, LDL receptor, PCSK9. Notice quantitatively, the LPA gene is the most potent risk predictor uh, when you look at it as individual uh, genes. There's a wide level of evidence for this being atherogenic, including primary care settings, you see here meta-analyses, Mendelian randomization, chief association studies. The risk seems to start at about 30 milligrams per deciliter, and it's approximately linear uh, in all of these studies after that threshold. There are also data now on statins. LPA, this is a meta-analysis that we performed in over 29,000 patients, 5,751 events. Notice here that the level, again, is linear at about 30 milligrams per deciliter or higher. This is now uh, data on PCSK9 inhibition from the Odyssey Outcomes trial. And depending which endpoint you look at, notice here, there's about a 25% higher risk uh, uh, of MACE within this highly well-treated population. Uh, and uh, notice the fourth quartile is associated with the highest risk compared to the uh, first quartile of LPA levels. And the fourth quartile here is 59 milligrams per deciliter or greater. And recall that the normal level is greater than 30 milligrams per deciliter. Now, LP little a is also associated with aortic stenosis, in particular through its content of oxidized phospholipids. 
I will not review this in this talk, but these are seven recent studies that are contributing to the database for LP little a and oxidized phospholipids being a contributor to aortic, calcific aortic valve stenosis. Now, we know that these um, uh, oxidized lipids and LP are present in atherosclerotic plaques. This is a saphenous vein graft intervention. And you see here the lesion before, and you see it afterwards uh, that's treated with a stent. Notice the atheroma. This atheroma was untested. Uh, and notice here with a mass spectroscopy, you can find very copious amounts of oxidized phospholipids uh, in this. This is a separate uh, uh, patient. Uh, notice here, this is a histology study from a patient that died. Notice the LPA, the oxidized LDL, and the oxidized phospholipids. That's very, very strongly prevalent in these large bulky atheromas. Oxidized phospholipids predict outcomes. This is eight studies in both primary and secondary prevention settings. And these seem to drive much of the inflammatory risk from LP little a. This particular test is called oxidized LDL, I'm oh, sorry, oxidized phospholipids per ApoB. And this is now commercially available for clinical act, uh, uh, applications. Now, PCSK9 is not, inhibition is not highly effective in patients with high LPA. This is a study called Anichkow. There was only a 14% reduction in patients with LPA level over uh, 50 milligrams per deciliter. And notice there's no difference actually in the um, FTG uptake with PCSK9 inhibition in these high LPA patients, suggesting that one needs to reduce LP little a to have some effect on the vessel wall. <clears throat> now, if you're seeing patients in clinic, does LPA, uh, measuring LPA uh, affect how you risk classify those patients? And the answer is yes. These are two papers published in JAK. And bottom line is in an in a intermediate risk category of patients, you reclassify all these patients that have different colors here, and that's approximately 40% of this group, which is about four out of 10 patients that you might um, have go into a low risk category because their LPA levels are low, or they might go into a high risk category if their LPA levels are high. Now, LP little a has finally made into many guidelines. Uh, there are now six guidelines, and I don't expect you to read this, uh, but this is just a summary um, of those guidelines. And the most uh, recent ones that were, should have a major effect uh, in LP testing are from the European Society of Cardiology and European Atherosclerosis Society, where they recommend measuring LP little a at least once in every adult patient's lifetime to identify those with highly elevated LPA levels that might have a, a CBD risk equivalent to familial hypercholesterolemia. Now, along with that, an ICD-10 code is now available. So when you see a patient in clinic, uh, you can actually uh, diagnose them with high uh, using these two codes. Okay, so let me take you through now where we are with this target. Uh, there's a phase two study was just completed and published. The drug was called Exia APOALRX. It's now called Pelicarsin with a generic name. This is a phase two trial. They used five doses and dose regimens. Patients were treated for six to 12 months. The primary endpoint was LPA lowering with some additional endpoints. And here is the main findings of the study. This is placebo. And this is 20 milligrams every week, equivalent to 80 milligrams a month. And notice a mean 80% reduction in LPA levels with a nice dose dependent reduction. Importantly, if you ask the question, what percent of patients get under 50 milligrams per deciliter, which is the recommended threshold for having minimal risk? And notice here, 98% of the patients achieve this level uh, in this study. So that suggests that you can pretty much get everybody to go with this particular drug. And it would also be a excellent uh, drug to use testing the LPA hypothesis. Now in this study, there were also additional beneficial um, Biomarker changes, including an oxidized phospholipids that you see here, LDL cholesterol, as well as ApoB100, all were significantly reduced uh, and some substantially. Uh, these are the absolute values in the highest dose cohort. Based on this, Novartis has now started the LPA Horizons Cardiovascular Outcomes Trial. The idea here is you take patients who are in the red, who have greater than 70 milligrams per deciliter, and they anticipate they have a median LPA of 90 milligrams per deciliter or 225 nanomoles per liter. They will be treated with pelicarsin 80 milligrams sub Q monthly versus placebo on top of standard of care uh, medical therapy otherwise. 
which could include statins, PCS kind of inhibitors, and azetamide. And they will be pushed into this green zone where they'll be mostly under 50 milligrams per deciliter. And the primary endpoint is going to be actually a co-primary endpoint, time to mace in people with LPA over 70, and a second uh, co-primary endpoint, time to mace in people with LPA over 90. The trial is anticipated to have a median follow-up of 4.2 years, so very robust, a minimal follow-up of 2.5 years, and 993 events. So you can think, I think, of this trial as, for us, uh, that was the first statin trial. It will be robust, well-powered, in, in substantial duration, and it will finally test the LPI hypothesis. Okay, I'm going to switch gears now to APOC3. APOC3 is a small lipoprotein. It's present in all uh, triglyceride-rich lipoproteins, but also present in LDL and HDL. It's made by the liver. It helps to both clear these uh, large yellow particles and also smaller particles. Uh, I'm sorry, it helps to prevent clearance of those particles um, because it inhibits some interaction with the receptors, but it also interferes with lipoprotein lipase activity so that it actually prevents their remodeling. Uh, epidemiology studies have linked high APOC3 C3 L3 levels to cardiovascular risk, and genetic studies have linked loss of function mutations in APOC3 to a 40% reduction in triglycerides and a corresponding 40% reduction in cardiovascular disease. Therefore, it makes it an excellent target for both rare disorders of acalomicronemia and also common disorders of cardiovascular disease. This phase two trial was just reported at the European Society of Cardiology. 140 patients were randomized to these four doses or dose regimens along with placebo. This is the dose equivalent. They got a minimum of six months and a maximum of 12 months. The primary endpoint was the fasting change in uh, triglyceride levels. And here is the final, uh, here's the primary endpoint, placebo, uh, trending to an increase, and then the dose 50 milligrams once every four weeks, you see here a 60% reduction in triglycerides, which is approximately twofold higher than the current standard of care. Uh, the secondary endpoints showed that uh, there was a significant reduction in APOC3 that was dose dependent, up to a 60% reduction in VLDL cholesterol, reduction in non-HDL cholesterol, reduction in ApoB in some of the cohorts, and an increase in HDL and ApoA1. Now, importantly, similar to the ApoA study, the question was asked how many patients can get to a threshold under 150 milligrams per deciliter, which is felt to be a level. And notice here that 91% of patients in the highest dose achieved an triglyceride of less than 150 milligrams per deciliter. Again, speaking to the point of this particular approach and the ability to get most patients to go. So what are the next, next steps with this uh, drug? A phase three study in familial chylomicronemia syndrome initiated. These patients get pancreatitis. They tend to have triglyceride levels in the thousands. There will be additional, uh, and they have a specific genetic abnormality in the lipoprotein lipase gene family. A second indication for multifactorial chylomicronemia syndrome. These are the patients that have multiple different reasons for very high triglycerides and also have pancreatitis as their problem. Another study is, uh, will be planned for patients that have triglyceride levels of 500 and eventually a cardiovascular outcomes trial in, in the more modest elevations of triglyceride levels. Okay, to finish up with angiopoietin like three, this is another lipoprotein that uh, inhibits lipoprotein lipase activity, and therefore it's affecting both triglyceride and LDL metabolism uh, through two, two, two uh, pathways, one through the LPL activity, but also reduces output of VLDL. So when you look at genetic abnormalities of angiopoint like three, these patients have low triglycerides, lifelong, low LDL. But interestingly, they'll tend to have also low HDL cholesterol, probably because this also affects endothelial lipase. Genetic and epidemiology studies are consistent with this being an atherogenic risk factor, and therefore it's also an excellent target for therapeutic intervention. Uh, this study was just published in Europe Heart Journal uh, last month. This is another phase two study, 105 patients, three cohorts. These are the monthly, uh, weekly or monthly doses. Again, similar duration of follow-up uh, or treatment and follow-up. 
And uh, this study included three uh, difficult to treat patients that had to have both uh, three things, high triglyceride levels, type 2 diabetes, and hepatic steatosis by MRI. So you can consider these as your most difficult, difficult patients to respond to these therapies. Um, notice here the baseline characteristics uh, that um, um, are, are shown. Uh, Middle-aged patients, uh, high BMIs, uh, hemoglobin A1C controlled around eight, 17% uh, hepatic fat fraction, and triglyceride levels 300 uh, plus range. This is the primary endpoint, up to a 53 to 47% reduction, depending on which dose is given in the primary endpoint, which is a percent triglyceride reduction from baseline. And these are the secondary endpoints looking at angel point like three, total cholesterol, VLDL cholesterol, non-HDL cholesterol, ApoB, and important C3 was also significantly reduced. So this drug tends to reduce most of the atherogenic lipoproteins uh, that are present uh, in patients. Now, this trial wasn't necessarily designed for a precursor to phase three because it had these very um, complex patients. However, Pfizer is now initiating a phase 2B study that is specifically uh, geared to patients with cardiovascular disease and elevated triglycerides, and this is ongoing, and this will choose the dose for the phase study, which will start probably end of next year. So with that, I'd like to uh, stop and acknowledge all of the folks that were involved in these trials uh, at Ionis, Axia, Novartis, Pfizer, as well as uh, academic collaborators that you see on this slide. Thank you very much.